In today's episode, we're going over how to safely return to squats and deadlifts after major lower back injury. Let's get going, guys. So <clears throat> what's the problem? I think the problem is pretty obvious, right? So <laughs> squats and deadlifts are certainly good for you. I'm not trying to argue that point. I make a living off of making people deadlift and squat more, right? I obviously believe that they're going to be good. It's just that every once in a while, they can cause an injury. Or if you have a major injury, those lifts are a little tough on the spine. So it's a little bit tough to return to, right? So in folks that have had a major lower back injury, so it could be a variety of different things. Maybe that you are squatting or deadlifting, you end up with some sort of disc pathology. So you're squatting, get halfway through a set, you feel a pop, a lot of burning in your lower back, you drop to the floor, you're laying on the platform for 15 to 20 minutes. Oftentimes these folks go to the emergency room afterwards. It's a super scary and traumatic thing, right? So what ends up happening is generally speaking, these guys get some medical advice. They go to the emergency room, they get some imaging. And the first thing is to rule out medical red flags. So if this is you right now, right, you do want to make sure that you don't have any red flags, which essentially means if you have any bowel or bladder problems. So if you're having trouble pooping or peeing, either you can't or you can't control it, obviously bad, head to the emergency room, right? If you have any progressive weakness, so if you're noticing that you're getting weaker and weaker in your lower body anywhere, not a good sign, head to the ER, right? Immediate medical attention. If you have saddle paresthesia, so if you can't have, if you don't have any sensation or you have any numbness or tingling in the groin region, obviously a bad thing need to get that checked out immediately. All right. But barring those things, if you're having kind of extreme low back pain, that's very, very debilitating. It's actually safe to kind of continue with your life as much as possible. Right. So oftentimes these folks get these debilitating, debilitating injuries. Uh, they're starting to get back. They're doing some physical therapy. They're starting to feel better. And they kind of want to return back to some sort of training. Usually that squatting, deadlifting, right. Some sort of training in the gym. They just don't know how. And oftentimes physical therapists don't have the specific knowledge of how to return folks back to training in the gym. So I basically want to go over that today. And the other part is that, and I see this all the time. So someone kind of gets out of the pain, they're, they're doing a bit better. They're not quite back in the gym full yet. They don't know what to do. And they want some information on how to get back to training. But the other thing they really want is, Hey, how can I stay safe for the long haul? I really don't want this to happen again. I don't want to end up in the emergency room again because my back is killing me. What can I do so this doesn't happen, right? So to summarize, what we're going to go over today is how do you return those fat folks back to training in the gym, right? What does that step-by-step -step, um, process look like? And the other piece is how do I stay safe over the course of time? Because this is something I talk to my athletes all the time that are trying to get back to training. How do I keep you safe in the long haul? Because what's really frustrating is getting back to training, getting hurt again, and then rehabbing getting a little bit better, back to training, getting hurt again. And if you do this yo-yo effect and over the course of time, you just don't make progress. It's also extremely irritating to the patient. So let's figure out how we can give some really good advice so folks get back to training and stay pain-free for the long haul, right? Fitness pain-free. Okay, so I think the first thing to think about is you have to meet the patient where they are in terms of their irritability or symptoms, right? So you're a physical therapist and you basically have a patient that kind of wheeled in on a wheelchair because they're so painful, right? That they can barely move. They can't even get out of the chair. They can't roll around in bed. I am not going to say, Hey, let's go see if we can deadlift. It's probably not going to go well, right? You have to meet that patient where they are. So you have someone who's extremely irritated and you're trying to get them to the point where they can just live on a regular basis, get to the point where they actually sit down in a chair and go to work, right? And maybe you're focusing on direction of preference exercises, maybe like McKenzie stuff, maybe nerve glides, maybe you're a manual therapist, right? Promoting some sort of active uh, motion is good for most folks in low back pain. This is not about handling those folks. Maybe I'll do an episode in the future, right? But suffice to say, if someone is extremely irritated, I'm not going to throw them under a barbell right away. You have to get those symptoms down a little bit get them to the point where they can tolerate a little bit of exercise. And then we can chat about doing some more squatting and deadlifting, right? So if it's super fresh, we don't push, but if a little further away and they're feeling a bit better, I really don't have much trouble pushing them into squatting and deadlifting early. 
as long as their symptoms are okay. And we'll talk about what's okay and what's not okay in a minute because it's it's a bit of a, a gray area, right? When can I start squatting? When can I start deadlifting, right? And I think the, the easy answer is A, you know, rule out medical red flags, make sure this person doesn't have something more serious going on. And if, as long as they're tolerating squats and deadlifts well, right, and it's probably okay to get started right away, okay? And the other piece is you have to talk a little bit about the patient's goals, right? So if you're working with a competitive power lifter, what you're going to give that person is going to be very different than an average Joe that really likes the idea of squatting and deadlifting, but they don't care how much they lift. They just want to be healthy in the long term, all right? So basically, if you have someone who just cares about their health, then there's a lot of wiggle room in terms of what you can give them over the course of time. So maybe they just trap bar deadlift in the future. They don't need to do heavy, heavy, you know, squats or deadlifts in the future. They can just do goblet squats and trap bar deadlifts and be super, you know, fine with that. Competitive power lifters, they might have a season coming up. They might be able to hit, have to hit certain weights to qualify for certain events. They're trying to push their squat and deadlift, obviously. They're going to have to deal with maximal loads. That's a different conversation. Okay. And we'll chat a little bit about this later. So. I think the first thing that I do as a physical therapist that you should do for your patients, right? After you've kind of ruled out any red flag stuff is you educate them, right? And uh, I love this uh, quote that I got from a study, uh, Bjorn et al., JOSBT 2015. That's probably a silent J or there's a silent B. I apologize. I, I'm, I'm botching this. I, I quote this study all the time, right? And what they found was deadlifts improve low back pain as effectively as low load motor control drills. And this is not the only study to show this, right? There's a bunch of studies right now that are looking at weight training, right? So lower body strength training, squats, deadlifts, all the like, right? Uh, programs looking at deadlifting. Programs are looking at squatting. They're helpful for folks who have low back pain. So if you have a low back injury, generally speaking, weight training is actually going to be your friend, right? Most of these studies are in more non-specific low back pain or mechanical low back pain. Do things change a little bit with, let's say, radicular low back pain or someone that's dealing with a disc injury, right? Um, or some sort of nerve root pathology? Maybe. I think we actually don't have enough research to answer that. Uh, what I will say is that I use squats and deadlifts to rehab all sorts of low back injuries, not just the non-specific ones, but also the ones that are more disc related, more kind of nerve root pathology related. Uh, what I will say is you have to be a little more cautious, I'd say, with radicular low back pain. Take your time. Go a little bit more slowly. Okay? That doesn't mean that they won't get better quickly. It's just that you have to be more cautious maybe about flaring them up. Okay? And again, that's an anecdote. There's no research on folks who have radicular low back pain that I know of. They're looking at, let's say, squatting and deadlifting versus other forms of you know rehab, such as walking or motor control, control drills. I don't know if that exists. It's just a personal anecdote. I find that if someone has dis disc pathology, radicular low back pain, you probably have to go a little slower with them. Generally, it's a little bit more of a serious injury, All right? Again, don't know exactly. <clears throat> the next thing I educate the patients is that exercise is medicine, okay? And this is pretty cool. I mean, there's a fancy term. I learned this first from Karim Khan, has a, an article about this in BGSM, it talks about mechanotransduction, okay? And simply stated, if you stress a given area with exercise, your body can adapt over the course of time. Okay. And what happens in a lot of folks, and this is for low back pain, but you know, especially for things like tendinopathies is that folks will get an injury. They'll try to rest it. And then when they return to training, it still hurts. And they're like, crap, what do I do? And they try resting again and they come back to training and it still hurts. Right? I'm like, what the heck? I tried resting this. This is not healing. What's going on? Well, you kind of have to force some adaptation a little bit, right? Our body is very, very smart, but in some ways it's kind of stupid. Okay. Just in the sense that sometimes you don't return back to your baseline from taking time off. Okay. And that certainly can be the case with low back pain. So I want people to know is that when you go in the gym and you deadlift and you squat, that can actually make you feel a little bit better. Okay. So the exercise is something that is going to improve your low back pain. <clears throat> the next thing I talk about is dosage. Okay. So if you go to your doctor and they say, Hey, I want you to take this antibiotic. They're going to give you a specific dosage. They're going to say, hey, I want you to take two pills twice a day for two weeks, right? And if you come back to the doctor two weeks later and things aren't going well, then sometimes they change the dosage, right? The doctor never says, here's a bottle of pills. I want you to go home and just take them, right? That would be a recipe for failure. If you take the whole bottle, you're going to die, right? If you don't take enough of them, you're not going to get better. 
So we have to have a certain dosage, right? So I tell us my patients, we need to have a good dosage of exercise. That's not too much or too little, right? You take two pills, your headache grows away. It's a perfect dosage. Take the whole bottle, it kills you. So we have to be very careful with the dosage we give the patients, okay? So the next natural question is, all right, so how do I navigate exercise in the gym? What's okay to push? What's not okay to push? Which deadlift variations are okay? Are certain weights okay? Are certain rep ranges okay, right? And the way I try to figure out what's okay and what's not is by using something called the pain monitoring model, okay? I've been talking about this for years without giving any credit to the person who kind of figured this out first. Um, so I guess uh, the gentleman who figured this out first was Tommy, and I'm hoping this is a man because I just said it was a man. It might be a woman. I apologize. Uh, but this was in the Journal of Physical Therapy in 1997, a comprehensive treatment approach for patellofemoral pain syndrome in young women. This pain monitoring model has been used for all sorts of pathologies. So patellofemoral pain here, but also with a lot of tendinopathy pain. So probably most popular is going to be either in the Achilles or the patellar pain or patellar tendon. So essentially what this pain monitoring model is, is they'll take two groups of people. You know, one group is not able to, is not allowed to work through pain. The other group is allowed to work through pain as long as their pain is less than about a five out of 10. And the other caveat is that your pain has to go back to baseline the following day. So in, let's say, patellar tendinopathy, they'll do like a single-legged squat, and they'll figure out what the patient's pain is. Let's say the pain is like about a 3 out of 10, right? And then they'll run them through a whole bunch of exercises. Let's say running, jumping, change in direction. Make sure that pain is below a 5 out of 10. And the next day, if your pain on that single-legged squat is still about a 3 out of 10, right? You didn't flare things up more. Then an exercise is okay to continue pushing. And when you compare those folks who are pushing into some pain, but the next day the pain kind of goes back to the baseline versus folks that aren't allowed to push through pain, the same outcome, right? So it's absolute no brainer to have your patients continue training as much as possible, as long as they respect this injury and don't too push too much, because generally speaking, the research shows that you can, so you can kind of gain some fitness benefit, some strength benefit and push this injury, right? And not flare things up and have the same rate of progress. There's also a little bit of research to show that if you push into some pain, right? So if you kind of ask your patients to push into a little bit of pain, they'll have a better short-term outcome. And that's awesome, right? Uh, and that really does reframe pain in your patient's mind because if they're starting to feel a little bit of that pain, I'll say, good, all right, we're putting the medicine where it needs to be. So if someone is deadlifting, like, yeah, it feels a little bit sore. We're like, all right, great, because the stress is going in the right spot, okay? Now, all of a sudden, it, flick, it flips the patient's thinking from, oh, crap, I can't and shouldn't exercise because the exercise is causing damage to, oh, good, I'm putting the exercise and medicine in the right area. So over the course of time, I'm going to progress, right? And that's actually very, very powerful, especially folks that are pretty fear avoidant because what happens in those folks is that every time they exercise, they feel pain. They're like, oh, crap, I'm not healed yet. I need to avoid all exercise until I start feeling better. Uh, and that's obviously not what we want. So flip that way of thinking in your patients. It's a game changer for sure. Okay. The next piece, and this kind of goes back to the idea of meeting the patient where they are. If we're going to use this pain monitoring system, right? It means that we may be able to get away with higher level loading, right? So maybe we can actually barbell deadlift with our athletes on day one, right? We may not be able to, because they're still a little bit too irritated. Um, so there are all sorts of modifications you can try to a deadlift to find a, a tolerable modification, all right? So in this modification infographic, all the way to the left, you'll see just a standard barbell deadlift, which is probably the most challenging thing on the low back, especially with heavy loads. As you move further and further to the right, so I go into a trap bar deadlift, and then I go to a high handle trap bar deadlift, and then I turn that into an elevated kettlebell deadlift, and then to a hip thrust. Each of these exercises are a little bit easier going to the right, okay? So what I do is I kind of start them off with what I believe is the most challenging exercise. It's probably going to be tolerated well. If they don't do well with that movement, I just go down the line one. Because at the end of the day, if the athlete wants to barbell deadlift, I actually would love to see them barbell deadlift from the get-go. But if they can't tolerate that, I start with the next best thing, okay? So that happens on day one. 
when I evaluate the athletes, like we'll go through a thorough evaluation, we'll look at their movement, we'll kind of kind of screen out any red flags, and then we'll go in the gym and we'll just try some movements, right? And then after we get a, an idea of what's tolerated well and what isn't, we write a program for them. And then it's this experimental process over the course of time, tweaking things, advancing, regressing based on symptoms, right? And we do the same exact thing for the squat. I personally feel like the deadlift is probably responsible for more injuries in the gym, although the squat can cause problems too. The other piece is that getting back to squatting is generally a little bit easier than getting back to deadlifting for most folks. That's not always the case. Uh, typically, if I hurt my back, squat is actually a little tougher to get back to than deadlifting. But in most folks, it's flipped. Uh, but just take this information with a grain of salt and make sure you're actually assessing the patient in front of you, treating them as an individual and not blanketly saying like, oh, deadlift is going to be hard, but squat's going to be easy. It might be the opposite, right? So the same modification ladder for the squat as we have with the deadlift. On the far left, we have a low bar back squat, which typically at high loads tends to be the most challenging thing for your low back to handle. Each exercise to the right is theoretically a little bit easier. So a high bar back squat, followed by a front squat, followed by a goblet squat, and then some sort of split squat variation. Best case scenario, we get them started with something like a low bar back squat right away. That's tolerated well. We keep that in the program. If it's not, we just go down the list and we pick the most challenging exercise that closest to the athlete's goals that they can tolerate well, not have a ton of symptoms the following day. Okay. And that's basically how we start the program from a squatting and deadlifting perspective. Now, if you have a patient that's very irritable, okay, you've gone through that kind of acute phase, calm things down slightly, but they're still having a hard time tolerating much in the gym. And I would just start on the right side of this modification ladder, right? So maybe you start off with a split squat in terms of a squat exercise, and you also do a single legged deadlift or hip thrust for deadlift exercise. And over the course of time, as they start to improve, so every two to four weeks, generally, I'm um, changing up their training program. You just give them something more top, more challenging as long as the low back tolerates it, okay? So if they're super irritated, you start a little bit further to the right. If they're not, you start a little further towards the left, and you just meet the athlete where they are when they come to see you, okay? Now, the, the modification that you use is obviously important, but there's a lot of other parameters that are important when you're starting to ramp back into squatting and deadlifting, right? Uh, generally speaking, the biggest one to think about is going to be load, okay? So you have someone who has a cranky lower back. They might not be able to tolerate 90% of the one rep max, but they might be able to tolerate 70% of their one rep max really, really well, okay? So generally speaking, when we introduce deadlifting and squatting for someone that had low back pain in the past, and we're trying to be safe about the progression back, we start with lower loads and work our way to higher loads. Now, what might that look like from a programming perspective? So oftentimes I'm starting off my athletes with a tempo. What does that mean? So maybe that's two or three seconds on the way down, a pause in the bottom, two or three seconds on the way back up again with a pause at the top. Okay. Okay. Now, what does adding a tempo do? Well, for one, there is a ton of time under tension. So your sets just last a long time, right? There's a big metabolic effect, right? So your muscles will start burning, right? You definitely feel like you're working hard. It's just that you can't use that much load because you're moving slowly, okay? Most folks with low back pain are load intolerant. We can still get a decent training effect without irritating the spine by keeping the loads a little lower, adding a big tempo, right? not aggravating the back. And over the course of time, the tempo becomes a little bit faster. So you start with slow speeds and work to faster speeds. Okay. The other thing that's really easy to change is going to be your rep range. So if you're doing really high reps, you can use less weight, but if you're approaching failure, you're still going to have a similar change in hypertrophy as doing heavier, heavier weights. Okay. Maybe the strength gains are not quite as good as doing lower reps, but it doesn't matter because your back can't tolerate it anyway. So we keep the reps kind of high at a tempo in the beginning. And over the course of time, we reduce the reps and we increase the speed. Okay. The other thing I like to manipulate a lot for my athletes returning to squats and deadlifts is called a rating of perceived exertion, RPE, or RIR, which is reps in reserve. Okay. So let's say you finish a set of 10. Okay. That set could have been pretty easy or could have been really, really hard. A 10 out of 10 set is basically you're pushing as hard as you possibly can. All right. Let's say you're, I don't know, your mom is stuck underneath a, a car and you need to deadlift that car up in order to get your mom out of there. And normally you couldn't lift that car, but you're just amped up with a ton of adrenaline. You're lifting, 
that car, that's a 10 out of 10 effort. Okay. You're lifting as much weight as you possibly can. Your eyeballs are about to blow out of your head, right? <clears throat> Let's say you go in under the bar and it's moderate challenge. You finish up your 10 reps, right? And you feel like you had, could have done another five or so more. Maybe that's an RP of about five. Okay. So I generally have my athletes start in an RPE of around six to seven out of 10. Usually that means you're leaving, let's say three to four reps in the tank. And every two to four weeks, I just increase that RPE or reduce the reps in reserve. So it gets more and more challenging over the course of time. Okay. Now I think folks get into hot water in general, if they do too much work, that's close to their max all the time. So we're going to talk about this in a minute, but generally speaking, I think for most of the year, <clears throat> athletes should probably not be pushing the envelope with the heaviest weights they possibly can. Now, do you need to push the envelopes in order to PR? Of course you do. It's just that we have plenty of research to show that in order to build strength over the course of time, you don't have to go to absolute failure. So that's another educational point to tell your athletes, because if they really want to push hard, you're probably going to be going to failure because there's a thought process. The harder you push, the better you get. And to an extent, that's real. But we do have research to show that you don't always have to push to absolute failure to improve. And oftentimes, if you're just pushing to failure all the time, you're increasing your risk of injury. Okay. So good age educational point for your patients. Okay. Now, let's say you have your patients back to deadlifting and squatting. Let's say they're doing some higher loads. Maybe they're doing five rep maxes, right? So they're pushing the envelope. They're back to their lifts, right? They're feeling pretty good. Here's the next piece. How do we keep these folks healthy in the long term? Okay. Um, and this is a bit of a, a challenging thing for patients to understand because what you're trying to do is change their psychosocial approach, change their habits, change their behaviors, right? Give them some ideas of how to change their program over the course of time. Uh, generally speaking, as a physical therapist, you're not going to be writing their program for the long term, although you can be. And you can actually tweak these variables over the course of time. Uh, this is great information for the coaches out there. So if you're a personal trainer coach and you do that primarily, you're writing programming, this is your bread and butter. This is how you keep people safe over the course of time. Okay. So the first thing I talk to my patients is managing expectations from a volume and load perspective. Okay. So everybody wants to do that fancy new program that comes out that has you squatting four or five times a week. Okay. 510 sets. Everybody wants to do German volume training. All these cra crazy programs have a ton of volume, a ton of intensity. Okay. Not everyone's spine is going to be able to handle that. Okay. I know this is a little bit unfair, right? Because all your buddies might be doing this stupid program and their back's not getting hurt, but yours does. Okay. And unfortunately, that's just kind of the way of the world. Not everyone's spine is able to handle as much stress as the person next to them. Okay. So you kind of have to figure out what your spine is able to handle. I use my hip as a guideline for a lot of my patients because my hip tends to get cranky with squatting and deadlifting. It tends not to be my lower back, but suffice to say for my spine squatting one to two times a week for my hip, excuse me, squatting one or two times a week is very reasonable. And over the course of time, my hip doesn't flare up. Okay. If I squat twice a week and I'm really pushing the envelope on those lifts over the course of time, my hip stop starts acting up, right? And over the course of time, this has been very consistent, okay? So I know that for my hip, squatting 100 times a week is very reasonable. As soon as I start doing twice to three times a week, I know I'm pushing the envelope, and over the course of time, I may start getting irritated, aggravated, okay? So for you, if you're a patient, they have to try to figure this out, okay? And they can't be surprised every time they hop into a very challenging training program, they get hurt, right? They really need to know how much their spine is able to handle and then manage the amount of loading that you do to your spine over the course of time. Okay. So figure out how many times a week this individual can tolerate squatting, figure out how many times per week this individual can tolerate deadlifting. For a lot of the athletes I work with that are into powerlifting, that's squatting twice a week and deadlifting once a week. Okay. And that may not sound too sexy, but it's a great way to progress over the course of time and not get hurt. Okay. The other piece is going to be the total amount of sets that you use. So if you're that guy that used to squat five plus sets per session, right? And you find that over the course of time, your hip just can't, or excuse me, your low back just can't handle that. You may have to back that off to two to four sets. Okay. A lot of training programs out there that have a lot of training volume, a uh, big one that I see a lot, and it's, it's actually a very successful program. So I'm not trying to talk trash on it, 
but just the mayhem CrossFit programming has a crazy amount of training volume. So you might be doing five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 sets of squatting in a given day, multiple times per week. That is incredibly hard on the body. And a lot of folks spines can't handle that. And that's a no brainer to me. So I just let folks know, like, of course, this is a little much for you. You might have to back off. Okay. Cause you may just find yourself in this very frustrating loop of getting back to training and then hurting again, and then getting yourself a little bit better, get back to training, throw yourself into this crazy training program and getting hurting again. Right. So you have to manage your expectations from a frequency perspective and also a total volume perspective over the course of time. <clears throat> The next thing I like to talk about is some sort of yearly periodization or planning. Okay. And this typically makes more sense for, let's say, power lifters, right? Uh, just because they're generally peaking for something. All right. And I think uh, what's important to talk about for competitive power lifters, competitive athletes is that they should be thinking about an in season and an off season. Almost all sports at the elite level have some sort of in season, off season. I know a lot of them don't. Okay. So some people are going to say like, Hey man, I played tennis year round at the top level and there's no breaks. I get it. I understand that. Is that healthy? I don't think so. Right. But for most sports, there's an in season and there's an off season. All right. There's going to be a period of time where you have to put the, push the gas pedal down, work towards your maxes, push, 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 push. That's going to make you a better athlete, but there should also be a period of time where you're backing off a little bit and not pushing your spine aggressively. Okay. So what I tell my patients with a history of kind of chronic low back pain, where in the past, their low back pain has been a limiter for their performance. If they push too hard, it's going to reduce their performance because they continue getting hurt. I let them know like, hey, I would say pick a good three to six months during the year where you're going to push hard and peak for a meet or two, right? And then PR at those meets, right? Or those training sessions, whatever you want them to be. If you're a competitive athlete, it's going to be a meet. If you're not a competitive athlete, it's going to be a, a tough gym session. PR your lifts and then back off a little bit. Okay. So that might mean that you push the envelope. Maybe you're squatting two, three times a week for three to six months. You're pushing the loads. You're pushing things heavy. You peak, right? And once you're done with your peak, then you back off and squat maybe one or two times a week after that. Okay. Maintain that. Maybe keep the reps a little bit higher for several months. And when you get back to that competitive time of year again, you push the envelope. So I, in my mind, that three to six month period is actually a little bit more dangerous, but it's also the period of time that's going to make you a better athlete. So you kind of have to push the envelope, but if you did that year round, you're a little more likely to get hurt. Okay. The other piece of advice I give the folks who have low back pain, this is actually a little tough for power lifters, right? Cause when you peak, you have to peak both lifts at the same time, but I give the advice to push your squat separately from pushing your deadlift. Okay. So it doesn't mean you can't squat and deadlift in a given training week. You certainly can, right? However, I wouldn't push heavy loads on the squat and the deadlift in the, train, train, in the same training cycle, right? Let's say you have a training cycle that lasts three months and you're playing on kind of peaking uh, weights on the squat. So maybe you're working up to a one rep max or a heavy three rep max at the end of a 12-week um, cycle and you're pushing the squat aggressively. I would not push the deadlift aggressively at the same time. So maybe in terms of deadlifting, you're only deadlifting one time per week. You're doing higher reps, okay? And you're not really pushing towards failure in that time period, right? And after you, let's say, finish that 12-week block, you max out your squat. Maybe you have another three weeks where you're not pushing anything aggressively, right? You're kind of doing a maintenance dosage. And then you have a 12-week block after that where you're pushing your deadlift, but you're not pushing the squat, okay? So you're only pushing one very uh, low back intensive lift at a time. And that changes throughout the course of the year. I think what happens is that if you try to peak both lifts at a given time, it's just a lot of stress to the spine and some spines just can't handle that. Okay. So we got to think about long-term health from a yearly periodization perspective. Okay. For the coaches out there, it's an absolute game changer. The next piece to think about is adding, I call it an insurance plan. Okay. So you see this research all over the place, not necessarily in the spine quite yet, but it makes a lot of sense and it probably will be studied at some point in the future. So if you are looking at a sport that has a lot of hamstring injuries, so I'm thinking about, let's say soccer, football, baseball, where there's a ton of hamstring injuries. If you do a program of hamstring strengthening, you know, Nordic hamstring curls, you will reduce the incidence of hamstring strain injuries. Okay. seems like a no brainer to me. You strengthen the hamstrings, you're less likely to get hamstring injury, right? I think the same thing goes in the low back. And again, I don't have a research study to just put in front of you and say, hey, read this. We have evidence to support this. I don't. 
I'm just extrapolating from other studies. But generally speaking, it makes sense that if you strengthen your lower back, it's probably going to keep you a little bit safer over the course of time, probably going to reduce the likelihood of getting injured a little bit. At the end of the day, we can't eliminate the risk of getting hurt. It's just going to happen, okay? It's common in powerlifting. Low back pain is common in powerlifting. It just happens, okay? However, we can probably reduce risk if we strengthen the lower back. So what does that look like? Well, for my athletes, after they've kind of gotten through this low back injury and they're starting to train again and they're squatting and deadlifting regularly, I make sure that we maintain lower back strength by adding in one or two exercises per week that directly strengthens the lower back, the glutes, the hamstrings. So what exercise do I like? Back extensions, reverse hyperextensions, glute ham raise, a good morning, hip thrust, pull throughs. All those low back intensive exercises are phenomenal. And what's really cool about those movements is that not only they're going to probably keep your lower back a little bit safer, they're also going to make you stronger. You know, you're going to improve your lifts by in increasing the strength of your lower back. Um, oftentimes a limiting factor in folks ability to lift more weight is their low back strength. So if we bring up your low back strength then hopefully we can lift a little more weight and hopefully we keep the low back a little safer as well. Okay. And lastly, this is a very, very important concept, right? And I don't think that, um, many folks are talking about it and it's actually kind of tough to implement. So I'll, I'll kind of show you how I implement it in my athletes is we have to think about stress, sleep, and nutrition. So we have to think about lifestyle interventions that are going to reduce the risk of injury in the future. Okay. Now what's kind of cool is that if you minimize your stress, take it down. If you increase the amount of sleep you have, especially consistency and not just your sleep quantity, but also the quality. I did an entire episode about this. I can kind of link that in the show notes. If you want to see how I intervene with my patients in terms of uh, sleep hygiene and the last piece is nutrition. So if you have better nutrition, you're having adequate calories adequate macros, micronutrients, it's going to improve your performance, right? The other piece that's probably going to reduce your risk of injury, right? We have some really cool research coming out of university athletes, and I've done some pretty cool podcasts about this. Uh, I'll leave that link in the show notes to some of those podcasts as well to show that stress is going to correlate with injuries, right? So poor sleep, high stress is going to increase the likelihood that you end up getting hurt, okay? And this is something that I am just guessing right? But I have a feeling that if you don't fuel appropriately for your workouts, you're probably more likely to get hurt. And we certainly have some research about this in terms of bone stress injuries. Uh, but in terms of like low back injuries in general, I don't think we have good research yet, but it makes total sense that you need to fuel well to recover from injuries and make sure that you don't succumb to overuse, right? I mean, you need the food to recover. It makes no sense. The nutrition wouldn't be important. Okay. So how do you do this? Well, I counsel my athletes on how to take a daily training journal. So what does that mean, right? So you try to objectify the amount of stress you have in your life. And you can just do this on like a zero to three scale. How stressed out do you feel? Zero is no stress. Three is a ton of stress. And I try to have athletes think about the amount of stress they have on that, on that given day, but also the amount of stress you've had in the past week or so, right? So give example, we're, we're uh, kind of redoing our house right now. And we have a, like a bunch of contractors doing work, right? And it's a low level of stress that's been going on for several weeks, several months now, right? So in terms of thinking about how stressed out I am, I may feel pretty good on a given day, but I've been going through quite a bit of stress for the past several weeks and months. So I want to think about that when I'm kind of writing down that number about how stressed I am, right? So you put that number down. Let's say you're a two out of uh, three, which is relatively high. Generally speaking, if that's how stressed out you are and you have a high level of stress, you probably need to take it a little bit easier from a training perspective. Okay. The same thing goes for sleep. Write down how much sleep you've gotten. I mean, we're trying to get somewhere between seven or eight hours of sleep per night. Obviously, it's going to be very different from person to person. But if you're burning the midnight oil and you're sleeping four or five hours at nighttime, you can't train quite as hard. And if you do train hard, your likelihood of getting hurt probably increases. Okay. Same thing goes with nutrition. One of the things that I write down in my training journal is A, how many calories am I taking in? B, how much protein? Okay. And if I'm behind, I haven't earned the right to train hard. Okay. So look at the stress, look at the sleep, look at the nutrition, and look at what you have for the given day, but also in the weeks prior. And then you make a, a decision on how hard you should be pushing. Okay. And I see this all the time. A good personal story for me is that I've historically had like a rock solid back. My back has been great. I competed in a strong man five years 
If you don't know about strongman, it's those guys that lift stones on top of pedestals and flip tires, do all that stuff. It is incredibly stressful on the spine. My back has always historically been good, right? It's been that area that I'm like, it's rock solid. Other things get hurt. But my back is good to go. You know, I've had some tweaks here and there, but generally speaking, my back's been really good through those years of competing. And then I had my first son, right? So I had Luke. I don't have more than one son, so I'm not saying first, but I had Luke, right? And obviously I didn't give birth to Luke, my wife, but <clears throat> moving on. I had more bouts of lower back pain in the first two years after the birth of my son than I've had in my entire life. You know what? I actually reduced my training quite a bit. Okay. You know what changed? Amount of sleep, amount of stress. I also was eating less, right? I wasn't doing a good job with my nutrition. What happened to my low back? It flared up a lot frequently. Okay. Could that be because I was picking up my son more and I was in awkward positions? Yeah, maybe a little bit. But I think the more obvious thing is that I was stressed and I wasn't sleeping and my back started hurting a whole lot more. Okay. So if you're a new dad, new mom, you probably can't train quite as aggressively. And if you get hurt, probably one of the reasons why. Okay. So it's just important you tell your athletes about this. I think it's really tough to make these behavioral interventions. Okay. Uh, but if you want to get to the next level, as a physical therapist and you want to help prevent these future injuries, I think it's one of the major things that's going to be game changer for you and your athletes. Right. Uh, so I apologize guys. This already went a little bit long, right? So what we got 36 minutes here. Uh, we just want to go nice and in depth. Um, that's all I have for you for today. Thanks for joining. And then I'll see you on the next one.